Welcome to the episode of the Race Aerospace Commemoration of the 50th Anniversary of Apollo 11 where the astronauts start their journey to the moon, pushing away from Earth orbit with the Translunar Injection Burn, or TLI. We are just past 2 hours and 5 minutes into the mission, and the burn will begin in about 39 minutes at 2 hours and 44 minutes, which will be 11.16 a.m. Houston time, Central Daylight Time, and 4.16 p.m. UTC. As you can tell from this clip, I will continue to try to be as complete about the original audio as I can be. As in the previous video, I will periodically put up the transcript so you can better understand what's being said in the command module, as there is a lot of background noise. This episode will be dominated by conversation from the astronauts as they get ready for the transfer burn, and then the transposition and docking maneuver, where the command and service module separates from the rest of the vehicle, turns around, and docks with the lunar module. So you got, you got your checklist here, right? Yeah. Yeah, they put all this TLI crap in my checklist. Even though I took it out, they put it back in. Now, Mattingly assured me that I was going to have a circular velocity versus altitude, you know, that when they get me in 100 mile on the other side. Mm -hmm. It's not in here either, but where would it be? It would be right in this. Let me just make one. Yeah, it's, uh, you know what the numbers are roughly. 25, 25, 50, 100 miles. Something like that, and it changes probably uh, now, but this was to be. Uh, What do you have on this side to give you that on the other side? I'm running a little bit on the warm side. How are you guys doing? I'll mm -hmm. be a tad on the warm side. Yeah. Dude, and gas pressure both look as uh, yeah, if we should be cool. into the mission. Apollo 11 about to be acquired at the Tananarive station. As expected, uh, this orb is yeah, changing slightly as the S4B third stage Vance. We're showing an orbit now at 107 by 105.7 nautical mile in an orbital period of 1 hour 28 minutes 30 seconds. We've uh, Acquired at Tanana Reeve, now we'll stand by live through that station. Apollo 11, this is Houston through Tanana Reeve. How do you read? Standing by through an enemy. It's going to be a long day. Standing by the first part of the attitude compared to the second part. I haven't done the second GDC line yet. Standing by the Houston Contact Net 1. Comes up on the next stage. About now. Got a voice, Houston contact, well, one. We should have some in read. Got a voice, we can get out first. Uh, Roger, we've got a read, 10 in read. Roger, 10 in read. 
Are you receiving Capcom's voice, or are you not blinking it? Negative. Ready. Monitor the... And they cleverly do Monitor this again and out. Yeah, we have to make one more transmission. Roger. Roger. Apollo 11, Apollo 11. This is Houston standing by. Move them out to Nana. Are you open? Houston, Apollo 11, Roger. All right, you're reading your last list. Did you get the power up? No, I haven't. Just a second, I'll be right with you. Houston, one minute to 
As we get closer to the burn in about 10 minutes, I'll start giving a brief overview of the lunar missions that led to this voyage. There are a lot of space missions, including Sputnik, of course, the first mission to make orbit around the Earth, that contributed to the Apollo lunar missions but didn't actually go to the moon. But we'll talk more about the full scope of space history leading up to this mission while we're in orbit around the moon. For now, I wanted to give a brief overview of just the lunar programs. What 
This is Apollo Control at 2 hours 25 minutes, and Carnarvon has acquired Apollo 11. At uh, LOS here at Carnarvon, we will have uh, several Arias Apollo range instrument instrumented aircraft in the area between uh, LOS Carnarvon and uh, acquisition at the tracking ship Redstone, so we may have the capability of continuous uh, communications between now and the TLI burn. We'll stand by through Carnarvon. Hello, 
Apollo 11, this is Houston uh, through Carnarvon. Radio check, over. Roger, Houston through Carnarvon, Apollo 11, loud and clear. All right, Roger, you're coming in uh, very loud and very clear here. Out. The astronauts are about to be given the go to transfer to the moon and they've already set up their spacecraft in preparation for that. It's counting down and will start the burn automatically, though the astronauts could intervene if necessary. Incidentally, short of something blowing up, this burn carries little risk. If the engine fails to ignite, does only a part of the burn, burns too much, or does the maneuver slightly off in the wrong direction, there's a chance for the service module to correct small mistakes and still manage the trip to the moon or, in the case of a large fault like not igniting or cutting out very early, it would facilitate an abort to bring them back to Earth without reaching the moon. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go for TLI. Over. Apollo 11, thank you. Roger out. The first mission to fly by the moon was Luna 1, launched on January 2nd, 1959 by the Soviet Union, a little over 10 years before Apollo 11. Its goal had actually been to impact the moon, but its booster burned for an incorrect time and it missed, passing by the moon at an altitude of around 6,000 kilometers. The moon gave it a mild boost so that it also became the first man-made object to reach orbit around the sun, the first artificial planet. The Soviet Luna program was generally ahead of American lunar missions thanks to the early use of the R-7 family of launchers, which were much larger and more capable than the launchers the United States had available at the time, Thor, Atlas, and even the Titan II that launched Gemini. Modified rockets of the R-7 family were also used to launch Yuri Gagarin, numerous missions to Venus and Mars, and are still being used today to launch people into orbit. America's first somewhat successful mission to the moon was Pioneer 4, which launched on a Juno 2, a rocket one-fifth the size of an R-7 rocket. Pioneer 4 was launched two months after Luna 1, but it was 6 kilograms compared to Luna 1's 361 kilograms, and it missed the moon by much more, only getting to an altitude of 59,000 kilometers at its closest. So it was clear the US was behind. The Soviet Union followed up with Luna 2, which did hit the moon's surface as planned, being the first spacecraft to do so, and Luna 3 was sent to photograph the far side of the moon, because the moon is tidally locked, only one side of it faces the Earth, and until Luna 3 we had no idea what the other side looked like. All these missions were in 1959. Then came almost five years of frustrations for both the Soviet Union and the United States. Both countries continued to send probe after probe, but all of them failed, some at launch, others on the way, and others when they reached the moon. The impasse was broken on July 30th, 1964, when Ranger 7 successfully impacted the moon and sent back thousands of photos of the surface as it closed in. NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, or JPL, had been getting a rather bad rap after Rangers 1 through 6 had all failed as these probes seem to be making the prospect of fulfilling Kennedy's goal of landing on the moon by the end of the decade seem unlikely, while the crewed program was getting set to surpass the Soviet Union with Project Gemini. But Ranger 7 worked, redeeming JPL, as did Rangers 8 and 9. Still, on its face they were only doing what the Soviet Union had already done on Luna 2, though they were getting better pictures. Then the Soviets finally scored a good lunar flyby after the five-year drought with Zond 3 in 1965, and then, something to really set the United States on edge, the first soft landing on the moon on February 3rd, 1966 with Luna 9. Yes, Lunas 4 through 8 had all been failures, but Luna 9 landed in one of the general locations that both sides of the space race were interested in for a crewed landing, Oceanus Procellarum, or the Ocean of Storms. Apollo 12 would land there, but Apollo 11 landed in the second most likely target, the Sea of Tranquility. The Soviet Union followed up two months later with Luna 10, which was the first probe to make orbit around the moon. Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Houston 11. Uh, Roger, we'll be coming within uh, range of the Araya aircraft coverage here in about one minute. Uh, they're going to uh, try uplinking uh, both on S-band and on VHF this time, so uh, if you turn your, make sure your S-band volume is turned up, uh, we appreciate it. And we believe that we'll have continuous coverage uh, from now on through the TLI burn, over. Oh, very good.
The United States made its own soft landing with Surveyor 1 on June 2, 1966, four months after the Soviets, also landing in the Ocean of Storms. That was just three years before this mission. NASA would make its first orbit of the moon with the appropriately named Lunar Orbiter 1, which reached on August 14th, also about four months later than Luna 10. However, while still lagging behind on probes, the US had surged ahead with crewed spacecraft by this time, docking two craft for the first time, as well as proving that astronauts could stay in space for 14 days, the expected maximum for an Apollo moon mission. Another plus for the US was that it had the budget to send far more probes. So between the launch of Luna 9 and the launch of Apollo 11, the Soviet Union had landed two missions on the moon, Luna 9 and 13. The United States had landed five surveyors, crashing two. The tally on dedicated orbiters was a bit closer, but still in NASA's favor. Apollo 11, Apollo 11. This is Houston through Araya 4. Radio check over. Houston, we read you uh, Tank 4 and uh, all in a uh, Roger, we're reading you Strength 5, uh, readability of uh, 3. Uh, should be quite adequate. Apollo 11, Apollo 11. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, we're reading you uh, readability about three, strength five. Uh, sounds pretty good. Over. Uh, so we've got a little static in the background now. Perhaps the biggest problem for the Soviet Union, oddly enough, was its lack of a reliable large launcher, and not just in the deficiencies of the N1 when compared to the Saturn V. The Soviet equivalent of the Saturn I was the Proton rocket, and it was capable of sending a small crewed craft on a flyby of the moon. They tested such a mission in September of 1968 with the Zon 5 mission, sending two tortoises on a lunar flyby successfully. Those were the first Earth life to travel to the moon, and they made it back safely, though the trajectory they came back on would have been too harsh for humans. The tortoises had gotten within 2,000 kilometers of the moon. Zon 6, launched two months later, basically duplicated the mission, but was not recovered successfully. So at face value, it seemed like the Soviets were keeping up with these successes, sending a spacecraft capable of carrying people over to the moon and recovering it. The problem was that the Proton rocket wasn't at all safe enough to launch people in, and wouldn't be human rated until the 1970s. In its pre-Apollo 11 missions, most Proton-K launches were failures. It had a less than 50% chance of even delivering its payload to orbit successfully. This is Apollo Control. We're 10 minutes away from ignition on translunar injection. We want to add uh, 10,435 feet per second to the spacecraft's velocity. Looking for a total velocity at the end of this burn about 35,575 feet per second. Combine the Proton's record with two dramatic failures of the massive N1 rocket prior to the Apollo 11 launch, and the Soviet Union simply didn't have a serviceable rocket to send the mission on. And perhaps the reason for that was the 1966 death of their chief designer, the man behind the unparalleled success of the R7 family, Sergei Korolev. It may also have been because the Soviet space program had started their crewed lunar efforts late, only starting in 1964, and were never given the budget to accomplish the mission, resulting in shortcuts when it came to testing elements of the mission, like the stages of the N1 rocket. Three months after Zon 5, and partly because of alarm that the Soviets were already sending life forms around the moon and might send people next, NASA decided to risk making Apollo 8 a crewed mission to orbit the moon rather than just have it do another test of equipment in Earth orbit. It launched on December 21st, 1968 and worked, producing the famous Earthrise photo. 
Incidentally, Earthrise occurs on every orbit of the moon, and plenty of the photos were taken after that, and it has nothing to do with the rotation of the moon. Relative to the Earth, the moon doesn't rotate. So, on the moon's surface, you would never see the Earth rise. Apollo 10 was launched on May 18, 1969, two months before this mission, and ran through everything necessary for this mission, except the actual landing. Three days before Apollo 11 launch, the Soviets launched Luna 15 as a last-ditch attempt to try and get samples from the moon back to Earth before the astronauts came back. An automated probe, Luna 15 would try to scoop up material from the lunar surface, put it into a re-entry safe capsule, and blast it toward the Earth for recovery. Contact was ultimately lost with it after its initial landing burn, and it probably crashed into the moon. You'll hear the astronauts discussing Luna 15, as there was some concern that it might interfere in some way with their mission. We will also hear a part of a press conference down the road where Frank Borman, who was in contact with the office of the Soviet chief theoretician Mstislav Keldish, presents the intended orbit of Luna 15, which would not intersect the Apollo 11 orbit. Apollo 11, uh, this is Houston through Araya 3, radio check over. Roger, Houston, uh, Apollo 11, you're much clearer and uh, adequately reliable. Uh, Roger, 11, you're coming in 5x5 uh, five five here, beautiful signal. That's a lot better than that static we had uh, previously. Okay. And we got the time base 6 indications on time. This is Houston, roger out. So there you have your quick rundown of lunar missions up to this point as the stage is turning towards its intended direction for the burn and the burn will begin in approximately six minutes. So I'll leave you for now and we will just let the events speak for themselves. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Uh, we just got telemetry back on your booster and it's looking good. Roger, Aaron, looks good here. Houston, roger out.
It's Apollo Control. We're two minutes from ignition now. Showing present altitude about 108 nautical miles. We expect to be at an altitude of 177 nautical miles at cutoff. Present velocity 25,560 feet per second. And we're a minute from ignition. All right, this is Houston. Uh, Slightly less than one minute to ignition and everything is go. Good. 
And the velocity uh, exceeds 29,000 feet per second, building up towards 30,000 feet per second. We got about one G meal. Pressure's good. We got three feet per second. Just under one G. Micro with a three feet per second. Present altitude, 115. And it's shaking. Yeah. A little bit. Taking that three minutes. Check camera doesn't fall in your face. I checked it. It's locked in there pretty well. Won't hurt the visor. 5.5, and it is 5.5. Nice ride. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Around three and a half minutes. You're still looking good. Your predicted cutoff is right on the nominal. Factor Apollo 11, go. See a bright star out there. Must be 31,200 feet per second. Forgot to memorize John Mayer's views out the window well enough to say that's Venus or not, and it's sure bright. Well, Altitude 125 miles. Say that's Venus. 10 feet per second off on this Glad I got my card up. I'm glad you, you did too, Neil. That was a good idea. A hell of a good idea. I can't see. Velocity 32,000 feet per second. Altitude 130 miles. 430. Altitude 430. How you look, folks? That's good. Uh, all about 14 feet per second. Now the altitude is very good. I'm going to get up real good. Five minutes cut up to be honest. One minute left to burn. Velocity 33,000 feet per second, altitude 142 and a half nautical miles. Do you guys agree with my mark will be five minutes and okay. a second? Five minutes mark. Okay, so Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go at five minutes. Magic, we go, magic, we go. We're just a little bit low on time. Right on it. Y'all. 34,000 feet yeah, per second now, altitude 152. Here in Jamie, we got a G 1.2 or 3, 1.3 next year. There's a lot more than that already. Yeah. 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 Time. There we go. There we go. We have cutoff. Cutoff. 3.3 on the Delta. Delta BC on EMS 3.3. Yeah. Velocity 35,570. EMS function off. Feet per off. second. Sex pyro Altitude arm. 177 BC. nautical miles. I got out of I got out of kilter here. Let's go back and let Buzz pick up on it. You're a little bit ahead of your Delta check, okay? Okay, here's some, uh, you read 11? Let's forget I read anything. Apollo 11, this is Houston. We show, show no, cutoff and uh, we copy the numbers on now 62. Okay, let's go to high you accept it. Apollo 11, Houston, do you read? Let's just try to get up high. SCS TVC servo power one off. Okay. You want to get Houston on the radio if you can? Yeah. PCM bit rate low? PCM bit rate do low. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Uh, do you read over? Roger, Houston. Apollo 11. Uh, we're reading the VI of 35579 and the EMS was uh, plus 3.3, over. Roger, plus 3.3 .3 on the EMS. And uh, we copy the VI.
So, with the spacecraft on its way to the moon, let's talk a bit about major events to follow. We are past 2 hours and 56 minutes into the mission. The next event is the separation of the command and service module in about 21 minutes, and it's docking with the LEM in about 28 minutes. That is in this video. In the next video, the CSM and LEM separate from the third stage of the Saturn V that boosted them to the moon, and that will occur at 4 hours and 17 minutes into the mission. After that is a fairly uneventful coast phase until the crew does a TV transmission around 10 and a half hours into the mission. Because Houston itself was not receiving that broadcast directly, but one of the other ground stations was, it was not seen until 12 hours and 15 minutes into the mission, which is where it will appear in the video. The astronauts have their first night's sleep starting around 13 hours in, at which point the only audio will be music and hourly PAO announcements. They wake up shortly before 23 hours into the mission. The only other major piece of business is a mid-course adjustment at 26 hours and 45 minutes. Other than that, there are some TV transmissions on the second and third day, with the crew entering the lunar module on the third day. That's basically what's going to go on until it's time to make orbit around the moon. With that, I'll cease commentary until the mission reaches the moon, because frankly, I don't have enough to say to fill up the time. The next video I'll introduce will be the Lunar Orbit Insertion video.
This is Apollo Control at three hours into the mission. Velocity now 31,214 feet per second. Apollo 11's distance from Earth, 1,245 nautical miles.
Apollo 11, this is Houston. Our preliminary data indicates a good cutoff on the S-4B. Uh, we'll have some more trajectory data for you in about half an hour. Over. This is Apollo Control. The S-4B has started its maneuvering to the separation attitude. At 3 hours 7 minutes, the velocity is 27,945 feet per second. Distance from Earth, 2,384 nautical miles. Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Houston, we had to uh, shift stations. We weren't reading you through Goldstone. Uh, we show Pyro Bus A armed and Pyro Bus B not armed at the present time. Over. That's affirmative, uh, Houston. That's affirmative. Roger. S4B has completed its maneuver to separation attitude.
Four minutes away from separation. Four minutes. At three hours, 11 minutes into the mission, velocity 26,314 feet per second. Distance from Earth, 3,140 nautical miles. The S-4B is reported in a stable attitude for this separation. Rates are less than one-tenth of a foot per second in all axes. One minute to separation. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Uh, your go for separation. Uh, as a, our system's recommendation is uh, arm both spiral buses. Over. Okay, spiral B coming armed. Uh, my intent is to use uh, bottle primary one as per the checklist. Therefore, I just turned day on. Oh, Roger, we concur with the logic.
We're awaiting confirmation of separation. Flies 
like a spacecraft just got a simulator. Hope that's good. Sure, beautiful. I hope you get some pictures. Uh, I got the 16 millimeter. Is it going? 16 frames at F8. Yeah. 70. 1250. Beautiful. They really look nice, doesn't it? Yeah, we're closing at a leisurely fashion. Okay, how long is this good for? It's, it's, it's on it. It's printed. Yeah. Yeah, it's six frames. It's 15. I'd suggest toward the end you probably goose it up a little bit. Do you want to get the whole thing? The thing is, it's there. I can't get much with the Hasselblad. I mean, there's no good, I'm afraid. Can I hold something for you? Take a couple of TV. Yeah, you might look, if you're looking for something to do, you might just look over my panel one and eight and all that, make sure all the switches are to your liking. The Goldstone Station reports a very weak signal. Uh, we believe that uh, Mike Collins is now maneuvering the spacecraft uh, in the transposition and docking maneuver, and uh, the antenna patterns aren't too good at the moment. So we have a weak signal strength. Goldstone still showing weak signal strength. Apollo 11, this is Houston. How do you read? Over.
Right now I had to be in Go ahead, power off. Go ahead, power off. Yeah, that wasn't the smoothest document I had done. Yeah, it felt good from here. I mean, the whole, I mean, the whole, I mean, the gas consumption would be a lot more than I would have guessed. You know, I thought I could about equal the simulator in the real world, and I did, and I bet you I used, uh, I hate to quote a number, but I've been down around 30-something pounds in the simulator, and I bet this is 50, 60 pounds in the simulator. Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Houston, do you read over? How do they, speaking of that, how do the service mod like get plenty of it? Oh, Buzzy, fooling around with that, let me just see. They, they, they're all 90 except D, which is above 90. Should be. Can't really tell them three. No, C and D are 93. Yeah, okay. Okay, Houston, well, well, I, I got to go in there and dick I'm not sure that we were getting enough. Well, Buzz, let, right now. Now let Buzz do his high game thing, and uh, I'll get ready to go dick with the tunnel.
This is Apollo Control, Apollo 11's velocity now 21,096 feet per second, distance from Earth 6,649 nautical miles. I-11, this is Houston, over. Hi, right, Houston, Apollo 11, go ahead. Uh, Roger, when you commented on uh, the Quad Bravo uh, problem at separation, uh, you're a little weak. Could you uh, go through what you did uh, after you noticed the talk back to Barbara Pole again, please? Uh, we copied the, uh, this is the primary and secondary uh, propellant talkbacks on uh, SMRCS Quad Bravo 1 to uh, Barber Pole on separation. Roger. Roger, that is affirmative, and uh, we moved that switch to the uh, open position and they went back to gray. Or? Uh, Roger. This is Apollo Control. We're 34 minutes away from extraction of the lunar module from its uh, adapter in the third stage of the Saturn. The crew has started pressurizing the limb.
Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11, go ahead. Uh, Roger, could you give us uh, some comments on how the transposition docking went, over? Yeah, I, I thought it went pretty well, Houston, although I expect I used more gas than I've been using in the simulator. Uh, the turnaround maneuver, uh, I went pitch Excel command and started to pitch up, and then when I put the manual attitude pitch back to rate command, for some reason it uh, it stopped its pitch rate, and I had to uh, go back to Excel command and hit what I thought was an extra proceed on the disk key. Uh, then during the course of that, we drifted slightly further away from the S4B than uh, I expected. I expected to be out about 66 feet, and my guess would be I was uh, around 100 or so, and uh, therefore I expect I used a bit more coming back in. But except for using a little more gas, and I'd be interested in your numbers on that, everything went nominally. This is Houston. Uh, Roger, we copy. That was Mike Collins giving the description on the transposition and docking.